We're very pleased to have Kevin Scott back. He was here in August, if y'all remembered, with his drones, telling us about antique launch, and, and, and antenna launching. And then he will be at Tech Fest this coming Saturday, giving another program. He's a wealth of program. For program manager, he's my dream. If I ever need something, I just call him. But take it away, Kevin. <laughs> Thank you, Randy. As you mentioned, I'm K4GTR, originally licensed as WN4BNU back in 1974 and got my advanced license at 16. So it became WV4BNU, but nobody could ever get that call right, so I changed it to the K4GTR because that's where I went to school, University of Florida. So I'm a gator. Oh well. <laughs> I appreciate that one. So, anyway, television. As you well know, there's been a lot of changes in TV, certainly in the past decade, but even recently, you may not know unless you're picking up stations over the air that you already know. Because you go to, go to find your channels like, it's not there anymore. What happened to it? Guess what? They had to change it around. Anybody seen the commercials for T-Mobile saying, we have this now, 600 megahertz. Okay, those are some of the TV channels that have gone away. So I'm going to go through some of the history of what happened with TV, as well as going in the progression of this whole van changing around, the packing as they call it and what's recently happened and what's still happening in other areas of the country and plus some other future trends. I'm going to go over HD radio, translators, I've visited uh, some tower sites, so I've got some pictures in the air going over that as well. So you'll have fun with some of that. So some of the TV channels that you remember a long time ago when TVs had remote controls known as children. <laughs> hey, go to channel 12. Okay, Dad. Click, 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 you're on channel 12. That was your remote control. UHF it was just this bunch of channels, 14 through 83. It's like nothing was ever there. All the stations, you take Atlanta, 2, 5, 8, 11. Those are your main networks. And South Florida, where I grew up, you had Miami, Fort Lauderdale, West Palm Beach. You had 2, 4, 7, and 10 in the Miami area. West Palm Beach had 5 and 12. They got their CBS from Miami because the low band VHF channels, just like 6 meters, have a much better range. So those lower channels, like Channel 2, Channel 2 WSB, tremendous range when they were on analog, which is why they're having to do some other things and now they're on digital. Their signal doesn't get out as far, they're on a higher frequency, they're no longer on 54 to 60 megahertz, they're now up at 500 megahertz, so big difference in how that propagation goes. So UHF, when it finally came along, some other stations started going in there, they're usually independent stations. Turner, Channel 17, started putting his stations in there, started broadcasting the Braves games when he went to be a satellite, when he went to the first station to do a superstation satellite. So all these UHF TV stations pretty much have what I would consider most people in the broadcasting industry to say were pretty much low power. There were maybe 100,000 watts, maybe 500 feet. On UHF, that just didn't get you out very far. For analog, a real full power UHF station with 5 megawatts of effective radiated power, typically up at 1,000 feet, preferably higher. Height is everything that we know on VHF and UHF. You want to get out, get up high, but you also have to have a high amount of power. So that's why UHF didn't really take off until cable TV came along. Then they had the mandatory requirements where all you had to put a fully powered signal out there and the cable company had to carry you. So then you started getting all these different local UHF stations that started getting some credibility. You had ones that were playing movies or special events or something like that that started gaining popularity, and they got kind of crowded, except you also had translators. You go up to the mountains, and guess what? You can't pick up the Atlanta stations directly, but you had translators like repeaters that were up on some mountaintop, and I'll show some of those as well, that would end up taking those signals and rebroadcasting them down to the valleys below. A lot of those translators were on these really high frequencies and even down in the Keys, I remember there was a bunch of translators that took the Miami stations and went all the way down the Keys to Key West on the channels like 70, 72, 75. And I remember seeing these as a kid on these towers. There were these Yagis that were aimed north and south, and those were they were picking up the station further to the north, transmitting it on like channel 72, broadcasting it further south. The next translator would pick up that station further north and just keep relaying on and on. Well, 
there wasn't really a whole lot of stations assigned to those frequencies except for translators. And there certainly were very few full power stations. That was no man's land. So when this idea of cellular telephone came along, FCC said, hmm, we got to have some, some frequency somewhere. Back during that particular time, you had IMTS, or Improved Mobile Telephone Service. And that's actually one of my first jobs while I was in college, <coughs> working for a mobile telephone company. That was on VHF and UHF, but those were either duplex or half duplex, <coughs> kind of like what our repeaters here. You didn't have the privacy. People could hear the conversations going on. Usually you had construction managers that would be driving around, have their phone in their truck. And it was all VHF or UHF. You didn't have cellular like you have now, for instance. You didn't have any type of privacy. But they had this new idea for putting in this communication system, and they needed real estate called 700 to 850 megahertz. So the FCC at that particular time went ahead and said, OK, nobody's using these frequencies. They're high enough in frequency. The antennas are physically short, so it's reasonable to use in a portable device. So they went ahead and reallocated that to cellular. And thus, not only was cellular born, but also there's another trunked radio system. So you had these contractors, instead of being on VHF or UHF, would actually have a trunk system. They would all share, <coughs> kind of like what we have with uh, D-Star. So you have this group of frequencies that would get recycled around, kind of like cellular. But you would have this radio for this construction zone that would have his own set of <coughs> zones or codes that would be able to talk to his own people, or her people, whichever it happens to be, but you wouldn't be able to hear the other person. That's how trunk operations work. And similar to cellular as well, you would reuse the frequencies, and you put these different little cell towers everywhere, like you have now, and you would reuse these frequencies because the range wasn't very good on them. You remember initially cell towers were really tall, and they found out, uh, we're getting too far, and there's only so many channels, and you go to make a phone call, it's like, Sorry, it's busy. So they drop the antenna heights down so you'd have a smaller footprint. You could read it, use those channels. Another thing that was also used on those UHF channels, police, fire, public safety. So now instead of VHF high band, or some of them were on low band, and they had these big honking antennas on their vehicles, now they could go with a much smaller antenna, 800 megahertz, put in a trunk type of system or a multi-site system, and now you would have something more reasonable that penetrated buildings pretty well, uh, you had a good coverage map with these stations, and therefore that's where these frequencies went to. So lo and behold, now you only had up to channel 69. So those other channels, gone. But they were moved over to cellular, and nobody really missed them because nobody really used them. <laughs> then the next group came along is channels 14 through 69 were the, the, the channels that run UHF. But around 2009, we had this whole, make sure I have that right, yeah, yeah, okay. Around 2009 with the DTV transition, I remember doing some research at this one company I was working for, and I noticed that some of the 700 megahertz frequencies, uh, below that, from 698 to uh, 806, those were all going away. And we're like, there's an auction for 700 megahertz? What's going on here? And I saw this lawyer group called Aloha Partners, which is buying licenses like crazy, dug into it a bit further, and found out that these TV channels were going away. They're going to have to move from like channel 69, which we have in Atlanta. They had to go find a new frequency. And anybody else that was higher that had to go away. And I'm figuring out, okay, where are these going to? Well, it turns out, there's your 700 megahertz 4G LTE that AT&T and Verizon, some other carriers have. Not only that, there's a whole public safety system because the 800 megahertz system that was set up Back in the early 80s, the one problem is later on, Nextel came on board. Nextel was right there sandwiched in between the police and you had, say you're in a crowded room and you're trying to have a conversation with somebody and you got somebody next to you talking real loud to somebody else. Well, the problem is the Nextel transmitters, their frequency was right next to the receivers of public safety and they were just causing massive interference. Those got moved eventually probably about 10 years ago to 2,000 megahertz, and eventually Nextel dried up and gone. But going back into the 800 megahertz Nextel, uh, that was also used up there, and they said, okay, we gotta, we gotta get rid of some of these other channels. So the um, public safety needed more frequencies. So the upper section of 700 megahertz got reallocated to land mobile public safety, 
And not only that, they said, hmm, we need to have a nationwide network that will allow public safety interagencies to be able to talk to each other. Like Katrina, you have that happening, that mess, you have all these different groups, and they were on different frequencies, couldn't talk to each other. So they wanted something national, but the government said, hmm, we want somebody to pay for this, but we want them to offer it free later on because we want broadband and everything else. It's like, forget about it. I'm not going to spend billions of dollars, not make any profit. So eventually they changed that tune. And now if you've seen commercials for FirstNet, that's an AT&T system that they've set up on these upper frequencies of 700 megahertz. So it's a nationwide subscription-based public safety mission critical system. So this has really helped out. There's also a lot of police and fire departments that have moved off of 800 down to 700, got a little bit of range. Antennas are a little bit bigger, but at least it gives them some room when they need to have some more frequencies, it gave them some more bandwidth. So that's where these frequencies, as far as uh, from 698 up to 806, that's where all those different channels. So channels 51 through 69 went away, and they also became now what you end up having your high-speed cellular phone. So that's really helped out quite a bit. Then they figured, hmm, this whole digital transition, when that took place, you had analog TV stations broadcasting the same content as they brought up the digital TV stations, because not everybody had digital receivers. They could pick them up. The government also provided converter boxes that allowed them to go ahead and be able to, okay, I need to be able to pick up my stations, and you could actually get a free box from the government that you could hook up to pick up your DTV station, convert it to the standard analog, or NTSC, channel three output, and you could still watch TV, especially for the emergency communications, tornado warning, stuff like that. But until they got that going, they had to use up a lot of spectrum. So you had analog, and you had, for instance, uh, Channel 11, WXIA had their Channel 11 analog station transmitter going on. At the same time, they had Channel 10 digital going on. So they were spending a big electric bill doing this. Eventually, when they had to go dark on analog, they dropped off of Channel 11, and now they're on Channel 10. You got Channel 8, PBS, uh, WGTV, they were on Channel 8 analog. They did a hard code over to, or switch over to Channel 8 Digital. So they just went ahead and swapped once and for all. And I understand just recently they changed over to Channel 7 as I was doing this research. It's like, oh my gosh, I didn't realize they did that. So what happened now with T-Mobile is just one of the big ones, but also Comcast, U.S. Cellular, and then a bunch of venture capitalists, very much like Aloha Partners did with 700 megahertz. They're buying up all these licenses, and they also have a bill, but then they're going to go sell these licenses to somebody else later on to put on more mobile services. In the same area of basically channels 37 through uh, 51, a lot of wireless microphones were used there. In fact, originally there were wireless microphones used in the 700, 700 megahertz range. And my church, I found this old wireless microphone. And, hey, tried it out. It didn't work there at the church, but it worked in my house in the basement. Worked great, but I went back to the church, it didn't work. Well, we had an AT&T tower right there, and then I looked at the frequency, and said, oh, 700 megahertz, no wonder, it's getting blasted, and then I found out they're illegal to use, so in the, uh, the closet it went. So that's also happening with the 600 megahertz, a little bit like these guys right here. I don't know what frequency this is operating on, hopefully in the 500 megahertz, the white spaces, as they call it, for TV, and that allows you to be able to transmit with low power and not interfere with TV stations. Hopefully, TV stations won't interfere with you. So that's kind of what happened there. And because of that, we're not having this analog and digital being transmitted at the same time. The TV channel assignments, uh, they didn't need as much bandwidth. And they said, OK, we're going to then repack you down there. And in addition, with digital television, it's not just one channel, one, one TV feed, like it was in the past. Analog, if you're broadcasting on channel 11, you're only broadcasting one source of information on Channel 11 with digital, and I'll show you a little bit later on, <coughs> broadcast a lot of different things. Because it's really, you've turned from being a broadcast medium into a data stream, just like the internet. And that's essentially what's going on. So if you want to put a real high definition signal out there, then you're not going to be able to put as much lower definition signals. If you put a bunch of standard definition signals out there, you can put a whole lot of them out there. But you got 19 megahertz, or 19 megabit per second, data that you can deal with, and 
And however you want to parse that up, that's what you end up having. So if you want to look more at the engine here, this is where I got this chart here. So you'll see, I'm going to end up sending this to you, Randy, so in a PDF format. I've got links in here, so if you ever look at any of the historical stuff where I got it from, I have a lot of my sources already in here as well. So you'll be able to get that. Oh, by the way, if anybody has any question, anytime, interrupt me. So, uh, I haven't kept up where the VHF, yes. what happened to him, is there still a channel too? Or there is. There is. And I'll go over that in a little bit, but I'll... Unless you want me to go over it no, now, no, I can no, do that. No, okay. no. But I'll go over that in a little bit with regards. There is still channel two. Six meters can still screw up somebody. Yeah. yeah. Um, but not as much as it used to. <coughs> oh, no. I didn't mean to do this. I didn't actually run this through. So I'm going to go ahead and jump into this. I didn't mean all this animation. Yeah. Cool. So, some of the crazy TV facts that are out there. Anybody know that there's actually a four megahertz window? between channel four and channel five? You'd think they're next to each other, but they're not. And that allowed, if you take a look at, even with, um, well, radio stations in particular, TV station, and ham radio repeaters. You're not allowed to have a certain, like, our particular machine, you can't have one in the town, the next town on the same frequency. You've got to have a certain amount of distance. Well, TV channels are the same way. So you're not going to have channels that are next to each other in the same town. But channels four and five, because there's four megahertz apart between those, you can have much closer spacing between those, which is why in South Florida, Miami had channel four, West Palm Beach had channel five. You could do that and get away with it. If it weren't for the fact that there was that four megahertz gap, then you wouldn't be able to do that. But what's used there right now, if you've been along the Florida Turnpike or other places where they have these call boxes, they work at this same band. Uh, unfortunately, this does not line up with the four meter band that's used in Europe. That's at 70 megahertz which falls right into channel four. So that kind of hurts us in that area. But for here, we have call boxes. There are also some hearing aid type systems for public auditoriums. So I had those at my church as well. They didn't work too well. They were very noisy. But they were in the, this 74 megahertz range. And it would allow you to take the PA system and pipe it through, and somebody could put a little earphone in there and be able to listen to the service. So there's not a whole lot in that particular area. Not a, I'd love to be able to use that as a, our own uh, four meter band, but who knows, maybe the FCC might one day let us use that one, that'd be a cool one. There is no TV channel 37 anywhere, and that's because of radio astronomy. They set aside that to be a quiet frequency, there's a lot of activity in that particular frequency range, so it's, there's nobody that's on that frequency. There is some medical devices that have been allowed, allowed recently, but that's all very low power. But if you've ever been to Green Bank, West Virginia, I'm not. But I've heard about it enough. I mean, there's no electronics here. But Channel 37, there's nobody on Channel 37. So that's why they, I think the FCC also picked, okay, we're going to stop at 36. Because 37 is a natural guard man. And 38 and up, gone. And that's where they auctioned that off. They also got a lot of money into the treasury. And some companies have a really big bill they have to pay now. The T-band. Because in large metropolitan cities, there just wasn't enough UHF and VHF channels. 800 megahertz didn't exist back then as far as for two-way radios. The T-band stands for TV. And channels 14 through 20 were used like in New York City, LA, Chicago, or public safety. So that was a whole other band that was used. FBI was using that as well. And another little tidbit. Now, I remember my wife and I were on a honeymoon in Canada. And I remember listening to a TV channel 6 on 87.7 on the FM radio. Because all FM radios, if you've got your car, you'll find you can pick 87.7. That was the analog channel 6 carrier. And at that particular time, a certain gentleman by the name of O.J. Simpson was driving his white Ford Bronco in L.A. And we were listening to the whole news story while we were up in the Canadian Rockies on channel 6. So it's kind of like, wow, this is wild. So since then... If you'll notice 87.7, if you flip it on your dial here, there's a station in Atlanta. They said, okay, we're going to go ahead and grab this allocation. Nobody's on channel 6. We're going to put a radio station on there. There's a legitimate radio station that's actually broadcasting at 87.7. Although I, the FCC database shows it to be channel 6, which would really mean 87.75. I'm not sure exactly what frequency they're on, if they're following TV rules or if they're following FM follow broadcast rules. Radio rules. Because the FM, the new ones are fixed. Well, they're stereo. Steps. 
I mean, if you tune to 87.7 and you have an 87.75, it'll fit within the bandpass, but your stereo on, F, on TV doesn't have the same characteristics. So you're not... Two, two additional FM broadcasts, 87.7, 87.9, and then 88.1 was the first of the original FM broadcasts. True. And 87.7, if you find somebody there, usually it's an illegal pirate. There's not too many... I've found a few licenses that are like low power, some legitimate license, but for the most part you find pirates on that particular frequency. So, I think I covered this already as far as the, the loss of the upper channel. Next L I mentioned. Uh, going back to some history as far as the cellular when it first came out, the way they set that up you had wireline carriers and non-wireline carriers. They wanted to have some competition because Bell South Mobility Back in the day, they had their own IMTS mobile telephone on VHF and UHF. So they wanted to be able to allow them to still do this, but at the same time, they wanted competition. So that's where you had AirTouch in this particular area was the provider, which later got by <coughs> Verizon, which is a baby bell. So it all ends up being sold around and worked around. Now you got AT&T, Verizon, the original Ma Bell companies that are now the main carriers, T-Mobile being a German company. Sprint was also a telephone and wireline company. What goes around comes around. So it's strange how that ends up working. So those channels for 700 megahertz, if you look here, you've got channels 52 through 69. You can see where they got allocated to. If you notice, this is UL for uplink, BL for downlink. And I'm going to talk about channel 55 in a little bit. But that was what is called media flow. It's who bought that service. But just like with repeaters, you've got your Transmit frequency and receive frequency, you want to make sure you get several megahertz separating them so you can have your cavities and uh, cavity filters and make sure you don't get interference. And that's what they did here. For public safety, they did the same thing. You got your uplinks up here, downlinks here. And this was more for the broadband system as well. So the lower half, this got sold to AT&T. And there were some issues with A at first because it was right next to channel 51. So there was some interference going on there. This eventually got sold to AT&T. Verizon's got a big chunk, and I have a feeling, I think even this section here is no longer public safety. I think that went to Verizon, I'm not sure, but Verizon's got like a 10 megahertz chunk. So they got a big area there. Oh, let me go here. Media flow. Anybody heard of media flow? Yeah, that didn't, didn't work. You've heard of it. <laughs> Well, before LTE actually went into existence, you had 3G. And try doing any type of video streaming on 3G. Forget about it. It was too slow. But when 4G came along, you had much wider channels, and you were allowed to have a lot faster streaming. Well, MediaFlow was somebody's idea, Qualcomm. Actually, they bought it from somebody else. And they have these transmitters. They bought a nationwide license on channel 55, and they were going to have you buy this other, like, portable TV for 250 bucks and subscribe to their service. So you get the weather channel, you get your news feed, you get other different things, and there were like 16 different channels. Well, because of all that expense, it didn't carry over very well. And once LTE came into play, and hey, I can go on my phone, and I can get the same thing here, I don't have to go on that, went out of business. So they took that off the air, and then uh, AT&T bought that particular group of licenses. <coughs> I already talked about this kind of stuff, so I'm going to keep moving on here. And I mentioned this as well. Oh, Dish Network was another one. They're like the number two auction winner. I'm not sure what Dish Network is going to do, but regardless. They want to do cellular. They want to do cellular. Okay. So anyway, this is what's going on with the 600 megahertz band. Like I said, if you want to see any more, I've got the link up there. Now, digital TV. What is now what we're using is digital TV, which has, whoops, all the HDMI, or I'm sorry, um, HDTV channels. With analog, you still have a six megahertz channel, but now they're fitting a digital packet, essentially, of information in there. The protocol is called APSB, or vestigial sideband, which means that one of the sidebands, just like with the old analog system, you have double sideband, we have single sideband that we use in HF quite a bit. A vestigial sideband is where you have a full sideband on one side and a partial sideband on the other. But with this one, they've got 
like you, uh, if you remember dial up and hearing the, that digital noise, this is just a lot heavier, more on steroids. So you've got a lot of different, in this constellation, you've got what are called I and Q signals. I'm not going to go into the details of it, but it just allows you to be able to pack a lot more data in this particular bandwidth. So as I mentioned, it's 19.39 megabits per second, which is quite a bit of bandwidth, unless you're on fiber, which is spoiled. Uh, you're not going to get that kind of bandwidth over the air, but this allows you to be able to broadcast a bunch of different channels. Uh, I know that it says you can do six standard definition channels, which standard definition is what the old NTSC was, which was 486 lines of visual lines. It was 525 lines. A lot of those were blanked out, but the actual visual was 486, so they came up with a 480i or interlace because they scan you know, the odd number of lines and they go ahead and scan the even number of lines and there's a certain amount of refresh that the old tube type TVs would just linger. Like if I shut the lights off, you'll still see these lights up here for a little bit as it kind of lingers down. It's the same thing with TV. So the standard definition channels are basically what the NTSC or analog was. But then now you have the high definition, so you have 720p. Channel 2 is 720 progressive where it goes over every single line, and then WXIA is going to be 1080i, so it's interlaced. So you've got 1,080 lines, and they do half one time and half another time. So, but it's still a 16 to 9 ratio as far as the pixels, as far as side. The old one was 4 to 3, so it kind of gives you a little bit of a box idea, and I know y'all are familiar with all that. So digital TV properties, you have what is called the virtual channel. And I know that was set up so people are used to seeing Channel 2, Channel 5, whatever else. If for all the transitions that went on, Channel 2, actually, let me go to Ion Television. Ion, WPXA, used to be on Channel 14, analog. Had a great UHF signal because they got a 1,500-foot tower. They're running 5 megawatts in Waleska. I mean, it had a really good signal. Well, worst comes to worst, they moved to Channel 51 during the transition. So they really got screwed. They got moved up to the highest frequency of all, and then they ended up moving down to 30, and now they're down, I'll, I've got it on the list there, they moved down even further. I think they're on channel 16 now, so they're almost back to where they were. If, however, you were, a viewer said, hey, I want to watch channel 14. Well, they're not on 14 anymore, they're on 51. Oh, okay, I flip over to 51. Uh, they're not on 51 anymore, I gotta go over here. It gets confusing. So they set this up to have a virtual channel that just happens to display in your TV, and they also have these subchannels, so it's like 2-1, 2-2, 2-3, so all your different subchannels. And it's just a way for the consumer to identify with all those different channels and subchannels. That's how that's set up. So for here, this one of these programs, it shows ABC, channel 2.1, and they have Escape as one of their alternate channels, which is a standard definition, and then LAP is another standard definition, so they're able to pack all that in there in that 19 megabit section. This particular app, and I'll go over that in a little bit, but this allows you to be able to find the station, so it's a single strength and everything else. Uh, channels 2 through 6 used to, as I mentioned, be prime real estate because of VHF low band tends to bend around the earth a bit more, especially channel 2. Well, when you went to digital, if you remember watching a TV show during a lightning storm, you're trying to watch the news, you're watching on channel 2, and it's just like... <laughs> tearing it up. I said, well, I'm going to flip over to channel 11. It was a lot quieter. As we go higher in frequency, you know, you're in 80 meters in the middle of summertime. Forget about it. You want to be on 10 meters if you're going to, you know, if skip is open, it's a lot quieter. It's the same thing with television. Well, the problem with HDTV, with the digital format, it's very susceptible to this impulse noise. So that's why channels, to answer your question, channel 2, yeah, you can still get on it, but because it's so much more susceptible to the impulse noise, and with all the electronics we got going on around everywhere, I mean, you go down Lawrenceville, Swanee Road, and the power lines, and it's just, <clears throat> there's all sorts of stuff, whether it's BPL or whatever else, it just tears up. There's a lot of noise there. And the same thing happens with television. So just because it's digital doesn't mean it's like FM, where it cuts off all the noise, and then you have this limiter in there that really allows you to get rid of the noise that you would pick up on a normal amplitude modulated <coughs> signal, it's still very noisy. So you'll find that you'll low power stations you'll find out on channels two through six, but for the most part, you won't. Although, since it's repacking, now you've got 36, actually 35 channels to use. And since it's kind of sparse as far as available channels, 
some stations are forced to actually go down to the low band VHF channels and put their signals in and just deal with the noise. So you'll find that out, and I'll show you some of that stuff as well. Any questions on this so far? So where is WSB now? They're on channel 32. They just moved there like in September. <coughs> so here's some examples on this particular uh, website. It lists the TV channels and all the different sub-channels. These are all standard definition, and then you've got these audio channels, which are really narrow band. So with this one station, you can get a whole pile of different you know, signals out there. And that leads us to something else, which we'll get into in a minute. Yes, sir? So those are the virtual channels you have listed. Correct. Uh, so with 32... Which it um, isn't anymore. It's changed. Right. <laughs> but so does that mean like the first few are on one real channel and the next few are on a different real channel? Because you have more than... Or maybe the first one's not high def. Well, they're, they're what's called standard definition. It's doubtful. I know for a fact this is not high definition. Yeah. This is not 1080i, 720p. Yeah, I guess with the 14s, that would be a better example. Uh, well, no, that's still... The Ion same. is playing older stuff, and I believe, and I'll take a look, I don't think it's 1080i. I think it all is 480i. No, no, 481 is, uh, is it, 720p. Is it 720 Okay. But you can cram some of these other lower. These are, I know, all lower resolution channels. And there's even some mobile channels they're throwing in there as well. Uh, same thing here with uh, channel 63. But this shows you, here's their real channel they're transmitting on. Although, like I said, this one's moved. Uh, this is also moved. This is much more recent. And it's only this the website didn't update the actual channel. But these guys, because they're in the 600 megahertz band, channels 37 through 51, they had to move. And they have moved already. So you'll see that more. But that's just the value of having a digital station. You can now put a bunch of stations in there that you couldn't do before. Well, with so much fewer stations, with so much fewer channels, that'll work. Um, here's some of the channels that had to move. If you look just in the Atlanta area, all those different stations, they were in the wrong place. So they had to move, and now they got a new channel here. And this particular station is gone. I've not found it actually moving to a new place. So a lot of them have moved, and I've found that some of them have actually piggybacked some other different stations as well. So let me, oh, by the way, before I jump into that, for Atlanta, you can see there is no channel 2 at the moment, but you got pretty much every single channel used up there. There's only a few spaces. There's no channel 5, uh, there's no channel 11 at the moment, no channel 13, but you could. Because with digital TV, you can pack them right next to each other. There's a lot of them that are all there. Right now, even at the same tower site, you'll find some stations that are right next to each other. They combine them because of the sharp filters and everything that are used nowadays, technology nowadays. They can do it, especially with televisions nowadays. Yes. The question is, when, when they change from one to the other, I mean, it's not going on flipping switch on the wall. They got antennas to deal with. They got mm -hmm. all, how does anybody go about all that? Good question. What they end up doing is they will have a spare antenna. And a lot of TV stations also have an auxiliary antenna, auxiliary transmitter, usually lower power. In this particular case, like for channel 2, for instance, because they went from 39 to 32, that antenna kind of works on 32, but they had to reduce their power to keep from burning it up because the VSWR is higher until they can get it fixed. With some of them, they'll actually put another antenna somewhere else so they'll piggyback another transmitter, they'll combine it, they'll put a combiner at another tower site somewhere, and they'll put a temporary transmitter to get them on the air while they take this other antenna off their tower, put a new one up in its place, and get that going. It's a costly yeah. operation. It is a costly operation, but T-Mobile's paying for it, and other ones are paying for it. So some of the money from the auction, they're actually going to the television stations. If I make you move, i got to pay for your move. So that's part of what they're doing. And when they, when they move, you'll hear them for... And weeks or months beforehand, start saying, on this state, yep. you've got to go to your TV and rescan, and the rescan goes and picks up the new information. Yep. So if you're not picking up a station, you have to go ahead and rescan. If it's, not, if it's been a while since you've done that. But yeah, there's a lot of TV stations on their old channel while they're broadcasting on the new channel. If you go to the old channel, you see a, a static screen that says, please rescan. 
and then eventually they'll shut that off. So, any other questions before I move on? So for what some of the other markets are doing, this is what I wanted to kick in here. If you take a look at Chattanooga, should have gone through and gotten rid of all the animation. Sorry. But in this case, ABC and Fox are on the same TV transmitter channel. They're just a different subcarrier. So you have two high definition channels, and then they've got some other one, TBD, which it's probably going to be a very narrow banded channel. There's not much bandwidth left over. But that's a, a situation where you got two of them doing that. Same thing with some other areas, like in Gainesville, Florida, you got Fox and Ion, and another one you got ABC and CW. CW is not exactly a major network, but it is still one of the bigger ones. Now you say they're on the same carrier. Are they actually on the same transmitter, same, same antenna? Transmitter. They're not on different carriers. It's they're on the same data stream. <coughs> yeah, it's in the same data stream. Yes. Correct. Yeah. So they're using the same data stream. Like so if you want to look at Digital TV, it's just really like internet data stream. But to get people back used to the old system, I'm going to flip the channel. There's a sub-channel that's actually aligned to that particular data stream. And I thought that they could only run one 1080i on the 20 uh, megs. No, I believe you can actually do a little bit with some compression see. techniques. Okay, so the, the original ATSC had limited compression techniques. So they've upgraded the, you know, the compression yeah. MPEG. I think originally it was still MPEG-2, and are we MPEG-4 now? That I don't know. That's I haven't dug into that particular part. But I know that they're putting those two on there. Maybe they're both 720p. I don't think so. Uh, they could be. ABC typically is 720p. So they may have done that. 1720p, 1780i. Yes. So it's a 6 megahertz uh, carrier. That doesn't change. How... How much bandwidth does a 720p stream take, and how much bandwidth does a 1080i stream take? The same. There is your, that's your ATSC carrier, right there. You've got this pilot, and you take up the whole space, period. Right. Now, whether you use all that data, you're going to have some dead spots in there as well, but you're still going to take up 6 megahertz of bandwidth regardless. Okay, and it's 20 but what Dave's asking is... Megabits, whatever megabits of signal, but the question is, a 1080i signal with that with MPEG-4 compression typically, you know, is fixed at a X megabit per second. Mm -hmm. It would be. And so I, you're, you're wasting other data. What is each resolution? take up of that 19 megabit stream. I do not know. Okay, that's what I was asking. Yeah, I don't know how much it would take. Moving on this one. Yeah, I think the original was there was, there was more than just a 1080p in it. Oh yeah. Um, so you could always add some things into it and then they can play magical things with the numbers. All right, so how do you find these different TV channels? This is probably my favorite one because it gives me all the sub channels and everything else. It's also sortable. What that happened there? Uh, this one is over the air DTV, OTA DTV, and you put in your latitude and longitude for the tower locator. This actually is the the uh, site for the tower locator itself. Because you go to the OATV website as well, and you get a bunch of different menus that may not help you. It explains some things about digital transmission and digital finding digital TV stations. But the one that's tower locator. You'll end up putting your latitude and longitude. You put your address and it'll calculate your latitude and longitude. So it's real helpful for the regular consumer. And then from there, you can see it's centered on Swanee, Georgia. And then there's all the different stations you can see where the TV stations are located. And then as well, each of these columns are sortable. You click on them and it'll sort by channel number. It'll sort by the direction. It'll sort by signal level. It'll sort by the channel number. As you can see here, you've got... I mean, channel 46 is broadcasting on channel 19. Channel 63, well, that's wrong. <laughs> channel 5 is broadcasting on channel 27. So you see all those different ones. NBC, channel 11 is broadcasting on channel 10. So it tells you what the actual real channel is operating. That'll tell you what kind of antenna you need. Because a lot of your HDTV antennas have high gain for UHF and usually just a bow tie for VHF, even if it has that. Some of them don't even have that. So VHF is not the prized possession that it used to be. <coughs> Everybody's on kind of on UHF, but some of the newer antennas are starting to come with both VHF and UHF because these VHF channels are being consumed. 
although they're high band VHF. The low band VHF channels, the antennas really aren't made for that unless you have an older antenna from the good old days, and those are the bigger antennas. You need something that's like a six meter beam to get down to. So this is one very helpful website. I like the idea that it also tells me the power, 1,000 kilowatts, the height, 615 meters. I know that's a really tall site. If I see something like 80, well, that's going to be VHF high band. But if I see something that's uh, like 15 kilowatts or something, and it's only 300 meters, I'm probably not going to pick it up. So I'm not going to worry about it. This is another website as well. This is Antennas Direct. They'll also try to sell you antennas on their website. <laughs> but it also shows as well a listing of available, available channels and the direction of the antennas based on where you're located. And another one, the FCC, this is their database. And this were actually, this was much more up to date. I found some of the channels. Oh, wow. This is where this is really going to be. And you can click on any one of these uh, channel or uh, call signs and it'll pop up the actual information, direction, channel number, the whole bit. So it gives you more of the detail of what you're actually needing to find that particular station. Plus it gives you the direction uh, of where you actually are. This other website here, this kind of shows you a coverage map, which is kind of cool. So you can see the terrain, you overlay that. There's a little blue line that's your primary coverage area and then all this other stuff you can see. If you're in this area, you're golden. If you're in here, you're not picking them up. So it just it really helps out quite a bit to kind of see where you are for some of these different TV stations. And it gives you a nice list there. And you can click on any one of these little graphics, and that's what allows it prints this out. It opens up a new page. If you click here, you'll end up getting that display so you know exactly what the coverage of those different TV stations are. So TV translators. Channel 2, as I mentioned in the very beginning, Channel 2 had a wonderful coverage area. Now they're on channel 32. It doesn't get out as well for the same antenna height. So what Channel 2 WSB has done is put up translators. They have one on WSRV's tower up north of, Bra north of Braselton, and that's on channel 46. And they have another one near Winder that's aiming towards uh, Athens, so that's channel 31, so that way Athens people can get channel 2. They got another one in Rome, another one in Noonan. So what the translators do is end up taking that signal and pick it up and rebroadcast it. This is a typical transmitter, translator site that I found up in North Carolina. I was on vacation. I happened to notice these antennas on this other mountain, so I drove over there. And lo and behold, I found, oh wow, this is what a translator says station looks like. So this particular one for channel 9, you had all these different beams. There's four different Yagis up here and they have them. It's not because the wind blew them out of the way. It's a kind of tapered them a little bit so when they split the transmitter signal to each of the antennas, they kind of had one aiming that way, that way, that way, that way. So they could get a little wider bandwidth of where they wanted to actually aim the signal. So you see this whole group here, there was UHF and there was channel 9. I'd say, I think this was channel 6, this was channel 9. So they had all these different translators, and these are the studio of the transmitter links here. So that was pretty slick. So this is channel 28. And that was up in here, Franklin, North Carolina, is what they were actually aiming on. You look where the antennas are aiming, Oop, right down to the valley. Now, some of these have changed frequencies since the repack, but you'll still find up there that you can get some of these stations through your translator. Question. Yes? So when, uh, when the main station changes frequencies, do the translators change frequencies? Not too? typically. Not unless there's now, because of some other... Oh, the translator must be able to accept interference and must not cause interference. So if somebody says, hey, I need that frequency for my full power station, the translator has to go and move to another frequency somewhere. And that has happened. So that works out. And as well, you have some translators because HDTV, because of the digital format, you don't want to be on channel 2 anymore, so they've moved to a UHF frequency. And some, for technical reasons, they've moved. My son and I are up in Brasstown Ball, and if you've ever been up there, at the tower up at the top, I looked, he said, Dad, what's that antenna? There's an antenna over here, and I looked at it and said, well, it's horizontally polarized, that's a turnstile. The antenna's a little bit too short to be something like on two meters or whatever, and it's too long to be on UHF. I'll bet you that's somewhere in VHF high band, a TV translator. Got back home, looked on the website, FCC website, lo and behold, it's channel 12. It's a PBS or a WGTV rebroadcaster, and they broadcast the Young Harris. And if you take a look, because they're up so high, not only do they cover Young Harris that go into North Carolina, they have a pretty good coverage. Only puts out five watts. 
but you're up that high. <laughs> and it's just a single, you know, zero dB gain turnstile, but it covers pretty nicely. So I could, I had it on my phone, the coverage map. I didn't get a chance to put the coverage map up there, but it's really nice. So here's my tower tour. Some years ago, I got to go to Richland Towers, which if anybody has been in Midtown Atlanta, there's a bunch of different TV towers down there. This one particular one, you can always tell it's a little different because there's a UHF antenna hanging down. That's the one thing that makes it a little bit unique. The company I worked for did a lot of business in the broadcasting industry. And I was at the NAD convention, talked to this one guy from Richland Towers. Hey, occasionally I come to Atlanta. I said, ooh, I'd love to go see a tower. So he gave me a call and said, hey, guess what? I'm here. So me and a few guys from work, we went on down there. So this was really, really neat. So that platform is at 1,000 feet. You've got a bunch of different FM stations and TV stations up there. There's another tower on that same property that also housed Channel 69, Channel 36, as well as WGCL 46. And then they moved over to this tower as well. So looking up here a little bit, you can see there's a lot of nice platforms up here. So when the guys climb up there, they can do their work and not worry about falling down, which is nice. Um, as well, there is that one antenna, that UHF hanging down. That was actually a spare antenna. You asked about what happens when you need to have a temporary antenna. Well, that's kind of what that was for. So it allowed somebody to have a temporary antenna to be able to on UHF. And a lot of these antennas are still intact. This was the analog antenna for channel 46, and this was the digital antenna for channel 46, which is actually was on channel 45 at the time. And then you've got this FM, which has all combined a bunch of different uh, FM stations in Atlanta. There were four, and now there's five on that one antenna. So they all combine their signals together in one antenna set up and a bunch of different antennas. That way they have a more uniform pattern. Uh, they're also at the top of the tower, so they have very little shadow. And then as I mentioned Channel 55 earlier, this media flow, there was their little antenna sitting right there. So I got to go up in this tower. Oh, before I get up in the tower. This is the combiner system for FM broadcast. So these are big. I mean, we're talking big. So there's all the different stations. I can zoom in on this one. This was for 92.9. Uh, I believe one of them was for 101.5. They actually have them all marked, and they combine them. This is not plumbing. Yeah. That's your feet. For those of you who know, that's really high power coax. I'd love to have that you know, for uh, working on two meters UHF or whatever else this is. It's got um, dry air, pressurized air in it, because you're running such high power, you want to make sure there's no arc over. But this is what they call a rigid coaxial line. The EIA, Electronic Industry Association, they're the ones who design this type of connector system. But these are all rigid line, this is all transmission lines. And you've got combiners, and the type of hybrid combiners that are here, you've got this dummy load that's taking some of the residual energy from I'm not going to go into great details of it, but how that ends up working. There's a little bit of waste power when you combine them, because you want to make sure that transmitter A does not see transmitter B. And so that's how you're able to do this, but there's always a little bit of errors in there, so some of that energy has to go somewhere. So they put it into a dummy load. It's not that much. If you've got a 20 kilowatt or 25 kilowatt transmitter dumping power into there, and you want to make sure it doesn't see the other one. Because if you ever tried taking a transmitter, one of your rigs, and piping into another rig and keying it up, gone. Why? That would be good. So this is how they end up doing this on a safe, safe basis. HD radio, digital radio. These are the filters that are meant for HD radio. And I'll go over a little more of the detail. You'll see picture-wise how HD radio works. But if you have like 92.9, WZGC, 92.9 The Game, they're broadcasting at 92.9, but on either side of it, you have these digital transmitters that are broadcasting the digital information right on either side of the main carrier. So if they combine those digital transmitters with the analog transmitters, and the digital transmitters are usually one-tenth or 10 dB, one-tenth or 20 dB down from the main carrier. So you've got a 100,000 watt station, you're going to be 10 dB or 20 dB down for your digital. Digital is much more efficient, but at the same time they wanted to make sure that you didn't get interference because you're now operating uh, not just on 92.9, you're operating on 93.1 with the digital, and they're also operating below that at 92.7, so you can cause interference. So they had to keep that down so you're not interfering with another station on the adjacent frequency in some other town. So they have these filters that are real, real sharp, and these fins that you see on the top, 
That's for heat dissipation, because they do get warm, pumping a lot of power through them. But those are for FM broadcast fan. You can see the more plumbing again, combining together. And then for UHF television, these are some of the mask filters that are used. And each of these is a cavity. One, two, three, four. And there's another one here. All these. Yep. They kind of look like it, but uh, they're interesting on the inside. I've seen them built. The company that I work for in, out of Germany, Spinner, they made these kind of filters, which is kind of cool how they do that, all that plumbing. And then for the UHF television, some of the combiners, one of these was for channel 19, which is channel 46, another one was channel 17, which was something else at the time, it wasn't WPCH. But anyway, they were all right next to each other, that's how they combined them all, all this plumbing. And then they went into waveguide that you see at the top here. So they had all the transmitters piping in your RF, and then it came out here as a waveguide, which will eventually go up the tower. So you'll see all this mess of plumbing and coax. You see there's some of the rigid lines, and there's some waveguides that are up there as well, and all the different coax is going up that tower. There's the base of the tower. You see it comes to a point. So that's a, over a 1,000-foot tower. And then as we are up at the top, this is a 1,000-foot level. So I love heights. So you can see the old Georgia Dome, too, in the background. So there's an elevator that... You have two friendly people that scrunch inside the top level, and another two people that scrunch inside the lower level. So this is the guy from Richland Towers, and this is one of my co-workers, and he came from down below and climbed up this. Now it's all safe. You've got you know, railings and everything else, but still, if you look up and see the clouds moving, it kind of makes you go, ooh. So it can, it can mess you up a little bit. Once you get your what we call sea legs or tower legs, then you're fine. But that's how you end up uh, getting out. Was the tower moving? No. Oh, yeah. If it was, Hopefully. I couldn't tell. <laughs> They're not. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure they move in a high wind, but it wasn't. Yeah. Hmm? It moves. It does move. You just don't feel it so much unless it's really windy. And it was a little breezy. It was a beautiful day in the wintertime. And it was nice. But this is, if heights bother you, don't look down. <laughs> So it's great. This is looking out here. You can see there's that UHF antenna that was hanging down below that one particular section. That's and there's another antenna going up. That's the leg of the candelabra? Yes. Okay. There's three legs of this. So this is looking out one. There's another one and another one. There's three of them. So this is just looking down one of the legs. <laughs> so there's our motley crew. <laughs> and you can even see more plumbing in the background going up to that one antenna that's up above. And I really wouldn't want to be the guy standing on that platform because no railings. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, there's some people, I've seen some free climbers that go up to change tower lights on a 2,000 foot tower. And I said, okay. Yeah, I'm going like, you're crazy because they do free climb, whatever. And they don't have parachutes either. So. so for the FM stations, there's a 10 bay, and it's a circular polarized. You've got both horizontal and vertical all together. So there's 10 different bays. So just like we have uh, you know, our gain antennas as well, repeater antennas, we've got four bays on ours, right? Yeah. yeah okay, so we've got ten bays. And it's on all three sides. So that way you get pretty much a circular coverage because you do get shadowing on a tower if you don't. So the UHF antennas, you can see here, this is a mounting bracket that mounted. There's the new digital channel on top of the old analog channel. And there's also a tower light at the top here, so they had to not only run power, RF power, up to this next antenna, but they also had to uh, run power to turn, turn on the light up there. But those are still there. If you go on Google Maps and zoom in on those towers, you'll see that, forget about it, we'll just leave them up there. So it just makes it higher, so why not? That works out well. Media flow, there was their little, they put about 1,200 watts, it wasn't a whole lot of power. But it also was a very efficient digital system, so that's why they didn't need as much power. And they're not trying to cover out in Timbuktu, they're just covering the Atlanta metro area. But that's since defunct, no longer in service. And then, this is looking over the other tower on the same property. So they did the same thing here. There's the analog and the digital. Here's the sections that's connecting the two. You can kind of see this other candelabra. And there's also an FM antenna mounted on L3 faces of that tower. So you can always tell the FM broadcast band. Are, are these the towers that are down off Memorial Drive that towards Atlanta? I know uh, Briarcliff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Shepherd's yeah. Lane. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So all the 
Rockcliffe, yep. Moreland, uh, yeah. that, that area. That's those towers. Yes, sir. So as we were coming back down, I thought that was a really cool picture. There was uh, WRFG. I was looking through one of their antenna bays. And then there's downtown Atlanta. That was kind of slick. And the antenna farm below, so the TV channels are getting all their different satellite work everywhere. And this is where they combine it all. And that was the other tower you can see on the other side. That tower, it doesn't have the pivot point on the bottom. It looks like it's rigid there. Uh, I can't that's, see the bottom of this one. That's another oh, that's, a self, that's another one. That's a self-supporting communication tower. Not nearly as tall. It's only about... 300 feet, but yeah, that doesn't have the pivot. That's I visited one of those things, and a guy told me that was one of the only towers of that type standing. You can see where they put a bunch of doublers on the bottom of it. I mean, it was reinforced from crack. But one time, Channel 17, w, what it was called WTBS, they were on a self supporting tower until they moved over to this section. They, they went up higher. They weren't as high back then. They had a self supporting tower. So, anyway, it's some really nice views from up there. The old Georgia Dome, and there's Emory's campus and Stone Mountain. Really nice day to be up there on high elevation. So, what's next for television? You're going to see this logo on TVs, especially next Christmas at Beth Buy. Guess what? Next Gen TV. We talked about ATSC. That's ATSC 1.0. That's the current digital standard. It's the APSB modulation scheme. There's a new one out there called ATSC 3.0. Now that one uses what is called an OFDM, or orthogonal frequency division multiplexing. It's a much higher data rate for the same 6 megahertz bandwidth, much more efficient modulation scheme. 57 megabit per second. That will allow you to then get 4K transmission. 1080p, 4K, and a bunch of other different data services. Now I've seen this one TV commercial, I'm sure you have as well. Hey, I'm out in the Gulf of Mexico and I'm picking up 4K TV. You're not. For one thing, as we all know, a body of water is a great place for VHF and UHF reception. So that was no joke for that guy to sit there and say, hey, with this I can pick up TV stations. Power's right over there, and of course it's going to pick up, but he's not picking up 4K. The only way you get 4K right now is off a Blu-ray player or through streaming services that actually offer 4K contact content. Anything going over the air right now is not 4K. Unless it's sad. Some yeah. Now, some satellite providers, are any of them dish no, if I direct, they're, they're, they're running some of the uploads. Yeah, those are. Yeah, because the national championship football game was broadcast in 4K. But that's all different services. I'm talking about for over-the-air television, you're not going to get 4K right now. Not to transition over to, say, TSC 3.0. Which, lo and behold, the TV you have right now is not compatible. <laughs> Guess what we have to go through? Another transition. However, this one is voluntary. Why they call it voluntary, I don't know, because the TV stations are going to want to move over to this new format because they want to be able to take your 4K TV that is really taking a 1080i or 720p signal and kind of faking for a uh, 4K. And it's really not doing true 4K. When I was in Incheon Airport in Seoul, South Korea, I noticed the TVs there, they were UHD, 4K, and it's like, wow, those are really brilliant. I thought it was some cable feed. It turns out South Korea was the first to adopt ATSC 3.0, this new standard. So those are actually broadcasting in this high-resolution standard. It really looks nice. So what they're talking about doing, the end of this year, for next Christmas season, you're going to see TVs branded with this. They're going to include an ATSC 1.0 and 3.0 tuner into the actual TVs. I'm hoping that some people will come out with a converter that will actually take the ATSC 3.0, convert it down to HDMI so you can use your existing sets. I'm sure they'll, they'll probably do something like that as well uh, as there's a transition. One of the thoughts that, one of the proposals as they transition over is they would, all the different TV stations that are you know, the main ones, they would go to one channel for their, their old HDTV signal. It probably is going to be a standard definition to be able to fit all those on one channel as they transition to ATSC 3.0 on their current channel. So if you still have an old TV, you don't want to go get the converter box or buy a new TV, you can still watch your content on this other channel until everybody transitions over and then that's going to go dark. And so that's kind of the proposal that's going on now. But we're talking about five years down the path. Yes, sir. Is it, if you have a 4K TV, 
it could take external content, like streaming content, mm -hmm. in 4K yes. format. It's just the tuner. The, the tuner. The tuner in it is not compatible. Correct. Now, if you have a, a tuner, external tuner, that is ATSC 3.0 adaptable or capable, and it's got an HDMI output that plugs in your TV, then you truly will have 4K. But the TV itself will not pick up this new next-gen system. <laughs> so that's another Christmas present. So it's a way for the broadcasters to get all of the new content. You can fit now with this 57... Certainly don't want to buy a new yeah. TV. Yeah. Well, and it'll do 3D. But, it'll but do the thing you have to remember, very few people get over their signals these days, so the TV doesn't really matter for most people. Sure. Only if you're getting over the air, it doesn't make a difference. Yeah, mo most people use TVs as monitors. Yes. That's true. But I know a lot of people that I work with, they're cutting the cable, they don't want to pay, so they're getting over the air TV. I still have cable. But yeah, it's 57 megabit per second, which means you can fit a lot more stuff in there. And that one channel, 32, that had all those different cha sub-channels, imagine what you could do with this. You could have a whole boatload of stations. So I'm just hoping the FCC didn't say, hey, you can fit more in the 6 megahertz channel, so let's get rid of some more for some more services, and then you drop down to channel 20 or something like that. We'll see. But anyway, this new format is coming to a TV station near you. <laughs> So I would expect the full transition by sometime 2024, 2025. But as I mentioned earlier, it's probably simulcast. So that way there's not a hard cut over like we did with the analog system. And eventually ATSC 1.0 will be gone. Bye-bye. Now HD radio. I'm sure you've probably heard of that. And you're finding more and more cars are having HD radio in there. It's called in-band on-channel. So you can still get your analog station, but they're using these other unused frequencies or there's expanding a bit more so that way you can get this digital station as well. For instance, locally here, this you go to HD radio and it'll give you a listing of all the different HD radio stations in your area. WSRV 97, their main analog carrier is going to be on 97-1, but then they've got like the other side of the river on dash 2, and they got another one on dash 3, and then they're playing a Spanish station on Four. You had a lot of them doing that. Yes. A friend of mine just got a car the other day and was playing around with the entertainment system, and they actually got a radar signal. Mm -hmm. A radar signal? Is that something that the standard station might be you mean, carrying out or something? You mean actual visual radar? A oh, weather well, radar out of Peachtree City. Oh, yeah. They're just putting it on a TV channel. Yeah, that's going to be on a TV channel. There are some of them that do stream TV. In fact, who knows? Uh, for instance, Channel 11. They actually have a weather scan. Of course, they have 24-hour weather on there as well. I'm not sure. That could be Wi-Fi or something else. Yes? LTE. I've been waiting for you to get this part. <laughs> yes. Good. Okay. So I accidentally found 98.5-2 yes. HD radio, and I love it. Yep. I can only listen to it in my car. No. Oh. So, I have, and I should have brought it with yeah, you could, but I do. I should have brought it with me. I've got a little converter for a car radio that actually it's an HD radio tuner that it has audio output, even through headphone jacks, whatever. I can plug it in. So I put it to a regular FM antenna or AM because it does both AM and FM. Although nobody's broadcasting digital AM at the moment. 680 the fan was and it sounded horrible. But uh, yeah, you can pick that up and you can get HD radios for your home. Just go on, look up HD radios for home, you can get table radios, I don't know if Bose carries them, whatever, but you can get some. And you can get that for your office too, but you can stream that as well. That same station is probably streaming. Right, check, check to see if it's streaming over the internet. And then they don't have to worry about the radio. I've been looking in the wrong place, I guess, because yeah. I have not been able to find it. Okay. I'll, I'll take a look at it and see if I can find it for you and get it to you. Because a lot of them stream, there's so many different streaming radio stations. Good deal. What's the WSB. WSB. It's their HD yeah, channel. Yeah, 98.5-2. And it's easy listening. Yep. 70s, Soft rock. 60s. Like Peach 94.9 used to be. Peach 94.9. No, commercials. Yeah, that's true, too. All right, so <laughs> FM, 
Back in the olden days, when it was first started off, it was strictly mono. Then they came up with this idea, how can we do stereo? Because we've got two ears. How can we get this content? So there's your standard uh, left and right channels. This is looking at the bass band. And each channel is 200 kilohertz wide. So if this is my center frequency, and I go out to 100 kilohertz, that's what's going on in an FM broadcast band. So you've got a mono signal here. Then they set up this 19 kilohertz tone. It's just a straight tone that's broadcast at 10% the modulation. And that's what turns on your LED or your light that says stereo. It detects that and then turns it on. That's used as a reference to take this double sideband. So this is amplitude modulated double sideband signal that they pipe in here that operates or that uh, uses the frequencies from 23 to 53. And as we all know, in order to demodulate amplitude modulation, you have to have a carrier. So this gets thrown in as a carrier in here goes through a detector circuit, which is pretty simple to do, use a diode once you have that carrier. And then that's going to be your left or minus right. You put it through a summing circuit, so you have two lefts and two rights, and there you have your left and right channel. You'll find that if it turns out your signal's kind of weak, and you notice there's kind of a hiss to your, when it's in stereo, that's because it's amplitude modulation, and therefore, as we know, AM tends to be noisy, so you, it's just one of the characteristics. Had they made this an FM, you wouldn't have that noise. So a lot of car radio manufacturers do, and even some home ones, they have what's called stereo blend. Is if it turns out there's a weak signal, they'll take, and instead of giving you 20 dB, or really a large amount of stereo separation, they'll cut it to be only 6 dB, get rid of the noise, chop off the noise, so you don't have this great stereo separation, but you still have the, the music and less noise. I prefer the, the noise and the wider separation. I like that. But you'll, uh, like Sirius XM, I've noticed some of the channels. Welcome to the Machine from Pink Floyd has a lot of really cool sounds. And on that channel 26, it was like doing this number. I said, wait a minute, what's going on? So it, it, that blend really messes you up. So that's how FM works. Now, the old ticker tape and stock market and what they call SCA or reading for the blind services, they were all using this blank space up here. Well, now. That's where HD radio is. HD radio uses these frequencies up here. In fact, they end up splattering into the next adjacent channel. Which is why if you're going, if you're listening to 93.3 93 and you go past Midtown Atlanta, it goes away because 92.9 has their digital transmitter and it blanks out and it messes you up. So there's your standard analog and you can see your carriers here for digital. And I won't go into... Uh, all more of the details, but it's really falling in the next channel. This is your main channel. If I've got 92.9, that'll be, uh, in this case, each of the band edges, and then this jumps over to the next one. So this is going to be 93.1, this is going to be 92.7. So you can see these really blast into the other channels. Uh, but this is where all these different sub carries and allows you to be able to get up to four different high definition music channels, or three high definition and one low definition channel. So that's how they end up doing that for FM. For AM, it's a little bit different story. An AM channel is only 10 kilohertz wide, but most, rate, most transmitters actually, they're allowed to broadcast up to 10 kilohertz as well, so it really flanks into 20 kilohertz. So for daytime coverage, it's great. But for nighttime coverage, you can get some splatter, just like if you're on 20 meters and some guy keys up next to you starts splattering, it messes you up. But they're looking at doing HD radio in here, and they do have it but it also uses these adjacent frequencies. So at one time when 680 The Fan was broadcasting in digital, what happened is they turned their transmitter on and just <coughs> anything on either side of that was just total noise. Mm -hmm. So it was just shot. I'm gonna rush through this because it's getting late. Yes. So analog radio spectrum, you can look through some of this later on, but this just shows you some of the things that they look to do for AM digital, and this will be all digital, which really wouldn't cause much interference. And then FM transmit later, <laughs> What you'll notice here in Atlanta, there's a lot of different translators that have sucked up all the available frequencies in Atlanta. 93.7 is a translator. They've got an antenna that's up at 1,000 feet, 250 watts, and look at the coverage map it has. It's great. So a lot of stations that are AM or that are on HD that normally you can't pick up, they'll rebroadcast an analog on these translators. So there's a lot more stations. There's like no dead spaces on the dial, as you can see here. There's almost nothing. It's all being consumed. And there's low power FM. This one's actually, this is how you can see right at Old Peachtree in 85. And there's several of those around. So, anyway, that's it. Thank you.